This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Returning to Coffee with Kenobi for a cup with us. He's actually drinking something hot, a hot beverage now. He just returned from the United States in an incredible whirlwind tour of all things Lucasfilm and Indiana Jones, including a stop at the Indiana Jones and a Dial of Destiny red carpet Hollywood premiere. You know him as the host of the IndieCast, the one and only Ed Dollista. Ed, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. It's uh, lovely to be back. I am so impressed with you. I mean, of course, I've never been shy about my love for you in the show, but every time I open Facebook, you're like you're like running for the mayor of Hollywood. You're you're talking to Frank Oz, Steven Spielberg, John Reese Davies. You're going all over the place. Um, talk about your amazing trip. But actually, let's rewind. Let's talk about when you first got word you're invited to the Indiana Jones and Dial of Destiny Hollywood premiere. Well, I've got to say it was. Uh... It was a bit of uh, discombobulation here at the uh, Dollister uh, household because um, we had been planning and I've been talking to you about, um, you know, heading heading to the States uh, around the time of the premiere. And we knew what the date was for the official opening of uh, to the general public of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. So I'd, a year ahead, I'd booked in um, some long service leave and I thought, you know what? I'm not going to be presumptuous and assume I'm going to get an invitation because, you know, I, I would never do that. But I do know that I'll be, I'd love to see um, Dial of Destiny with um, Mitch from the IndyCast and a few of the IndyCasters if they're available. So let's make it a bit of a holiday and a bit of an adventure. And then I've, I was talking to you about, oh, well, where would you stay if, you know, if, yeah. if it was going to happen or where do you think it would happen? And you um, uh, suggested Lowe's or Hollywood Hotels. And okay, oh, let's have a look at that. So I booked in there at a certain time and then um, we got um, some wonderful, We uh, being out of school holidays, we got a wonderful um, premium economy flight all booked, which was lovely and everything like that. And we had everything sorted and going, we'll see. And then closer to the date, uh, there were rumors swirling around that the, that the premiere was going to be like two weeks earlier and then it premiered in Cannes and then all yes. this sort of things happened. And then so we're going, oh, gosh, okay, I'm going to miss it. You know what? That takes a bit of pressure off because it was a little bit anxious too about, oh, my God, what do, what do, what do you wear at a premiere? What do you do? <laughs> and, you know, what what's going on? So Basically, Mitch and I had just finished recording our, uh, I think it was our last crusade special on Mitch and Ed's Excellent Adventure because we record on my time Saturday mornings, Friday afternoons, and then uh, pretty much hung up, getting ready to edit, and Mitch messaged me going, oh, my God, I've just got an invitation. And I checked my emails and going, oh, my gosh, I just got an invitation. (laughs) Except it was for the, I think it was for Wednesday at my date. I'm still not sure what day it is. I'm a little jet lag. Um, it was for a Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday and I was flying out on Sunday, the the following Sunday. And I'm going, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss it by a few days. And Kelly goes, you have to go, you have to go. So we had booked everything from our, um, uh, we booked our flight through a travel agent, but everything else I did myself. So we quickly ran down to the travel agent and trying to go, can can we switch flights and everything like that? And it was it was it was a mess to be honest. And it and it um, ended up because Kelly had to f- still fly out on the uh, a little bit later. So we any any anyway, we ended up getting a flight, which was good. So I flew out the day before. Um, cost a lot of money, but it was worth it. I can tell you to change that flight. Yes. Um, and then trying to figure out, okay, I need to stay at a hotel. Mitch had already booked stuff. So we stayed, it was myself, Mitch and, uh, Les David from throw me the idol. So we all shared a hotel at, um, at Lowe's Hollywood hotel. Fun. And, uh, we were there the night before. And I think I was up for pretty much 24 hours, um, awake for that whole period. And, um, it was just the most amazing experience uh, to have. There was a, I'm sure everyone who was following it has seen all the, uh, you know, the pictures of all the indies and everything like that. And we were there on the um, red carpet. There was a bunch of people invited um, fans, you know, to dress up as Indiana Jones. That was another thing going, oh my gosh, I don't really have a, you know, Jack Sparrow. 
yeah, sure, yes. but not um, not an actual proper Indiana Jones outfit. Or I'm I'm sort of not. I'm, I wouldn't call myself like Darth Kmart, where you know I've just got you know <laughs> cheesy stuff uh, to put together. I've got an official hat and I've got yes. an official jacket and things like that. But the rest of it was more of a of a feel. So piecemeal. Yeah. So I was sort of, but I looked pretty good. I thought I yes, looked you look good. terrific. And, you know, oh, thank you. And me? you know, some people are who, like um, Matt Wacker and these other guys who are look amazing you know they're 100 percent accurate but you know i think it's the i think everyone was really accepting which was really good because i thought i would have been you know thrown out of town um if i'd gone that's not accurate or he didn't wear that or it's on the wrong side or something like that oh, yeah. um but they were great and then a bunch went into the uh we had to line up there was a bit of a delay um a bunch were in at the actual red uh sort of like there was a, a pit or a mosh pit with some indie mm-hmm. fans. Now, Mitch and I didn't get in there, and we sort of had to walk through, and we're going, oh, this is a little disappointing. I've flown all the way, you know. So we ended up walking through, but everything happens for a reason, and uh, I ended up, I got to speak with um, Karen Allen to say hello to her, which was wonderful, and um, Ethan, uh, the young boy who plays Teddy, got to have a, a very, very brief chat and just say congratulations. And he, he seemed like a really nice kid, which is mm-hmm. great. And then Mitch and I are just standing at the end of the red carpet, so past the press line where everyone is. I know and, exactly uh, what you're talking about. Yep. And But all the other indie fans are bunched up, you know, trying to get a quick selfie with, you know, what have you. And my goal really wasn't to... Um, I've, Mitch and I have both been very blessed in that we have met Harrison Ford before. Um, and uh, so I feel like I didn't need to do that. If it didn't, if it happened, that would be amazing. If it didn't happen, that's okay. Um, so I was just happy to be there and soak everything up. And we then met Les and Laird, Day, um, um, Laird Malamud was there, which was fantastic. And we got to catch up and we were just waiting there. And I noticed the two guys from Hasbro um, oh, yeah. You know who do the um? I fo- sorry, I've forgotten their names. Patrick but, um, who and do the- yeah, and the, one of the designers and Patrick. Mm-hmm. So I go up to them and have a bit of a chat to them and just say, you know, I love the figures and you know it's great what you're doing. And they said, oh, we've got a few more coming out, which is wonderful, and um, which is great. So we're just standing at the end. So all the press basically, I'm doing hand movements, so I apologize. But all yeah. the press, um, you know, once they do the press, they basically walk past us. And Toby Jones walked past us and. Um, Kretschner walked past us and um, the Dutch giant who you couldn't miss, you know, cast a shadow over the entire thing. And uh, so we're walking there and, and that's great. John Rhys Davis walked past us. Ki, Ki, um, who Kwan, who, was, um, who Mitch knows from the um, convention, quickly walked past. Mitch yelled out, but he didn't hear. I'm going, oh, that's okay. And then all of a sudden uh, we see George Lucas. So George Lucas walks past us. I was in the presence of George Lucas, yes. which is enough. Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy, which is great. And then Steven Spielberg appears. And I don't know what compelled me, but I just said, hey, Steve, which <laughs> I would ne- normally, <laughs> normally I'm a Mr. Spielberg or I'm always pretty polite, but I don't know what it was. And Mitch and I are the only two dressed at the end as Indiana Jones at this, you know, because everyone else is in that mosh pit. And he looks at us and he goes, Wow. And he's surprised by what we look at. And I never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd, I'd have Steven Spielberg see me, let alone look at me dressed as Indiana Jones and be impressed by You got a wow saw. from the man. I know. And then Mitch asked him about the Fablemans of all things, you know, as, 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 as we're having a really sort of a pretty brief interaction because he did stand and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, converse with us. And then Mitch asked him about the camera move and he goes, well, what do you think? And then he waved to us and um, continue on. I've got this amazing photo that looks like it should be out of um, uh, People magazine or something yes. like that. And then he walked on. And all those other indie guys, they had a great experience, but none of them got to speak to Steven Spielberg. So I thought that was the most, that was the most amazing thing. And then they were trying to usher us in as quickly as we can to get into the movie. And we're going, well, we're going to hold off as long as we can to try and get um, to see if Harrison Ford, because we could see him and sure. we could see Phoebe Waller-Bridge and Mads Mikkelsen and everything like that. But it was just a little bit, they were just a bit too f- forceful without being forceful. So they pushed us on anyway. So then we got in, uh, we had amazing seats in the mezzanine. Oh, I don't know. 
people were on the ground on the on the lower floor the orchestra um it's usually called in theater we were on the mezzanine but we were dead center and the screen was set up we had perfect view and of course the people came on the the creatives it was wonderful see, to see them all again i'm sure everyone has seen that video and uh uh of that and then steven spielberg says you know really indiana jones is three people it's harrison ford it's george lucas and it's john williams and then the screen goes up oh. and, and oh my gosh there is john williams and a full orchestra and it was absolutely amazing we were, we were um we joked you know what if the film was no good and it's fantastic i, I you know i love it it wouldn't matter because the experience and that was the most amazing thing that I've really experienced. And my many trips to the United States, I've been very lucky. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to see John Williams. He's always like been on when we were flying out or within a few days. And I never thought I'd get the chance to see John Williams live. And, uh, and I did, and he did three amazing pieces of uh, music and it was just uh, amazing and then of course we had the film on top of that which is fantastic and then mitch afterwards decided to text key to see if he was around and key um texted him back saying yeah i'm at the premiere at the uh I'm at the premiere party at the roosevelt hotel come on in i'm near the food so we go <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to be able to get in and we don't want to crash anything because we didn't want to you know yeah. we were very grateful to being there and we don't want to be you know those those people right. so we um so we basically went there and we're waiting and um i think Le it was myself les and uh laird and mitch and uh laird decided to um i no, actually les said well why don't you just give him a call so he called him and he goes okay i'm trying to find you and trying to find you and there he arrived and there was key and and you know mitch was saying oh ed's come from australia so it was lovely to meet him i've got a lovely autograph of um from key from um when he was at terrific on but you know he was, it, I don't know if you've ever met Key, but it's just I have not. like, well, it's he just looks like, wonderful. He, he is such a, um, what you see on TV is what you, you get. You, he's such a genuine, um, embracing and lovely and genuinely interested. And he, that was lovely. So, so that was, that was to top the, you know, that was a, to top the end of the night, which was amazing. And then we went out to the in and out burger, like midnight oh, just down the perfect. road and we recorded a round table, which I'm going to um, edit today. And then basically after that, you know, it just sort of goes, okay, well, what's, what's happening now? So um, everyone else left. Mitch was there. We went to a Disney California adventure, Mitch and I, and then Mitch left and I had to um, stay two more nights waiting for my wife to arrive. So I had booked in at the Roosevelt hotel and my room wasn't ready and I'm just waiting there and I'm editing the, um, the indie cast and our Mitch and Ed show because we recorded a live sort of a live after the, uh, the fact show. And, um, and I'm sitting down beautiful lobby, you know, it's where the first Academy awards were. Everyone should, if you're ever in um, Hollywood, you should go there and have a look. It's beautiful. So I'm sitting there and uh, a guy comes and sits at the desk, the table in the lobby, just, you know, close, very close by with some FedEx packages. And all of a sudden this familiar um, person walks in and sits down and it's um, John Reese Davis. And oh. I'm going, oh, okay. That's right. <laughs> so my cat is excited as well. Yeah. So, so. Um, and, uh, and I'm going, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? So I took a sneaky peek and the guy's giving him um, the, uh, retro collection Sala figure and the adventure series Sala figure, which I unbeknownst to me a few, um, you know, a week or two later appears with him in the uh, Hasbro pulse video. So it's all makes sense um, after the fact. So the guy leaves and John um, exit. So I thought I have to do something. I have to do something. So I went up and just um, quick, was very polite. And I didn't say, Hey, Hey, Johnny, I said, uh, Mr. <laughs> Davis, you know, I'm, I'm just, I was at the premiere, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, of course. And, the, you know, we had a lovely photo. And I just said, I just wanted to say thank you because you were the very first interview that I did on the podcast 16, 16 years ago. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you. And, you know, I really loved your performance. And he goes, well, come on. I'm going, what? Yes, come on, you know, let's do an interview. So oh. I said, what? <laughs> and he goes, you know, if, if you 
if you take care of the fans, the fans will take care of you. So let's sit down. So I'm going, oh, my gosh, uh, because I wasn't ready for an interview or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, so we sat down for about... I know. Well, we sat down for about 10, it must have been about 10, 10 or so minutes because I, I was conscious not to, I didn't want to take too much of his time either. And I was scrambling to come up with um, intelligent questions. So we talked a little bit about Dial of Destiny um, and his performance and how his, you know, he for, uh, for us at the IndyCast, he never was a sidekick. He was an equal to Indy. So it's great mm-hmm. to see him, you know, back. And he gave, and I asked him a little bit about working with Sean Connery and Denham Elliott. So he had some stories about that and a great Spielberg story. And it was wonderful. So, so that was the, that was, that was the end. And that, even though it was just the beginning of my, my, uh, you know, US adventures. So, you know, Kelly finally, uh, arrived and we did uh galaxy's edge which oh my gosh we we did your first time right <laughs> yeah it was and oh my lord we met up with um a friend of ours mark um at uh um at uh, galaxy's edge and i ended up buying a um a boba fett rocket pack and the wrist gauntlets because oh, i yes. want to do a boba fett costume and uh that was pretty cool we had an absolutely amazing time there that i think we spent we spent two whole days at disneyland proper and most of the time we rode uh, rise of resistance four times um smugglers run four times we just were it was amazing and then we're off to connecticut to catch up with mitch where we caught up with um jerry ordway um the wonderful um artist behind batman 89 and death of superman and so many other things and we all caught up and uh uh you know just having a good time with uh Mitch checking out Connecticut and um, we then uh, Indiana Mick came and we saw it in IMAX uh, Dial of Destiny, which was fantastic. It was great to see it again because that whole night I was saying um, it's actually was a bit like a wedding uh, where you sort of go, what what just happened or did this? Mm -hmm. And like, and it's funny, the second time we saw Dial of Destiny, we were just really tired as well. And it's like, I just need to be really a hundred percent. I don't know, you know, so I can take everything in. So there was so much, so and then we were off to um ended up, ended up um in New York for a couple of weeks, which was wonderful. Met Bob Gale, the creator of Back to the Future, nineteen forty one. Though I'm sure he's you know most people wouldn't be too happy about that, but I love nineteen forty one. Um, got to see Back to the Future the musical. Caught up with Frank Oz, who we had, who was the nicest guy. How did that happen? Um, we were we were seeing a play called The Grey House, which was not a very good play. Actually, no, it wasn't great. It was had um now it had uh Tatiana, I've forgotten her last name, Maslani. She Hulk, yes, and um, and uh, it was like the cast was great. It just it just missed the mark a little bit. It's like a horror, it was a bit like a horror story, but it just wasn't mm. as good. You know, I think they just couldn't end it, didn't know how it ended. It. So we exited and go, Oh, that was good. And I'm going, Oh my gosh, Kelly, that is that is Frank Oz. And Kelly's going, where? And I'm going, I'd look because I know, I know, I know Frank Oz. Um, and he was there talking to some people, and uh, Kelly's going, Well, oh, say hello. And I'm going, Well, I can't. He's in a conversation. And I didn't want to be, you know, rude. That's his private time and everything like that. So I said, Okay, let's, uh, he's crossing the road. So I'll cross the road as well. So we both crossed the road. And then he decided to, and he walked straight towards me, him, and um, which we found out is his son. And I go, oh, Excuse me, Mr. Oz. And he goes, yes, in that, in that voice. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, oh, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan and I just wanted to say, um, you know, just wanted to say hello and uh, just, you know, thank you for everything. And he goes, oh, great. You know, that's lovely. And um, Kelly interjects, thank goodness, saying, oh, well, don't forget to introduce yourself. You know, so we introduced ourselves and we just said, well, we're just at the Grey House. And he goes, well, what, do you th- what did you think of it? And, um, and then we had this huge th- theatre conversation and you know it was wonderful, and it was just like having having a chat with a you know regular person. I think because I wasn't going, oh, remember in the Muppets when you did this, or when you uh-huh. directed, um, you know, little shot. You know, it was just having a conversation about right. about theater. And he asked about. I said, so I said, well, I was just here for the opening of um, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, and and it's great. And he goes, oh, is it really? Is it? Good? And I said, it's one. It's great. You need to see it on the big screen. He goes, oh, good. I'll go and see it. And, you know, this is my son and, you know, we'll go, go see it. And I go, oh, lovely. And he was the loveliest. And I said, would it be okay if I have a photo? And he goes, of course. And his son took a wonderful photo and um, fantastic. it was, it was great. So it was, 
it was um you know the hollywood gods were um smiling on uh myself for this uh whole trip and it was an amazing experience this is vanessa marshall and you're listening to coffee with kenobi KiwiCo, that's K-I-W-I-C-O, is defining the future of play by making it engaging, enriching, and seriously fun. They create super cool hands-on projects designed to create a lifelong love of learning among kids. Each month, KiwiCo delivers crates packed with fun and sparks creativity with kid-friendly topics and options. This month, we had the Do-It-Yourself Kids Bottle Rocket, which is like the classics you would always loved when you were young or you saw on TV. Redesign and create your own bottle rocket. And at the end, you get to launch it into the air. And it is so much fun. Mason and I had a terrific time doing this, making it come to life. And it, it promotes steam, right? It promotes all these great things that are happening, exciting things happening in the world of education. And as an educator and as a parent, you know I absolutely love, treasure, and value these things. These crates cover a ton of interesting topics and provide real hands-on skills for kids to explore. From engineering robots to learning about the science of cooking, there's something for every kid. The best thing about that Create Your Own Bottle Rocket is that Mason likes the process of building as well as playing with the actual item that KiwiCo sends over. And it's fun to see his mind work as he learns, you know, sometimes when you do these things, they are more challenging, but in a very good way. And seeing him get his hands on it and learn from failure, learn from, hey, this didn't actually work, but let me try it a different way. I feel like that legitimately hands on skills and teaches things to kids that will transcend anything that they do as youngsters because that kind of perseverance and that love and passion for learning as well as enjoying life too are what KiwiCo helps to facilitate. Your child will definitely get those cool hands-on science, art, and geography Projects delivered to the door every month. They'll be so excited to see these arrive in the mail. The day the boxes arrive is like their favorite day of the month. You'll be surprised at how quality, high quality, in fact, these materials are too. These are really engineering, science, and art projects for kids. You're not going to believe what your kids can build and accomplish with KiwiCo. You can give them the tools to learn new skills, build new experiences, and make new connections to the broader world. The best part? Watching their confidence grow as big as their smile. Redefine learning with play. Explore hands-on projects that build creative confidence and problem-solving skills with KiwiCo. Get 50% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line at KiwiCo.com slash CWK. That's 50% off your first month at KiwiCo.com slash CWK. No, I, I'm so happy for you. I mean, you know, good things happen to good people, but great things happen to great people. And I consider oh, you just you. a great person because your sincerity and your authenticity and you're, you're a true fan and a, and a true human. And I love how you approach it too, because I very much believe actors and professionals in this, in this industry, to us, it's like they're, they're like demigods, but to them, they're people doing a job. And I think yep. if you approach them with grace and respect, and try not to fanboy, for lack of a better term. I feel like good things happen. So it is It is so cool to see that. Now, I also was invited to the premiere, as you know. I was I not do. able to go because I was with a number of Coffee with Kenobi listeners on the Halcyon, which is great in of itself. But I remember seeing the invite. And I remember, because I've been fortunate to be invited to a couple of these things. I remember reading it and it said, wear your best Indiana Jones adventure attire. And I thought... The first thing I honestly thought was, oh, I can't wait to see what Ed wears. That was exactly. <laughs> and obviously, Steven Spielberg got the memo, too, because of that great little interaction, which is tremendous. So you saw Harrison. I think you sent me a picture. Or I saw it on one of your feeds. But you were you were fairly close to me. Was he like signing autographs or talking with folks? He was to, he was doing that that press um, oh, tunnel line. or whatever it is. So as he was walking in, and they were trying to um because everything started a little bit late. Um, sure. the uh, security or whatever whoever was organizing it were a little antsy and just wanting trying to move things along. You know, they had all these you know celebrities and they had everything and obviously the orchestra that unbeknownst to us, you know, waiting and everything like that. So. They were pretty close, but only at, like there was also um, 
opposite the El Capitan. I went to the El Capitan and saw Elemental, which was wonderful. Oh, good. And that, and which you know, uh, that's a whole other thing. You know, that that's a beautiful theater in itself. Um, yes. And um, so they had um, like um, that was cordoned off, so people, just the general public, could um, you know, sort of yell out and see a little gap from um, from there. Um, along the street, and a few of them, John Reese Davis, and um, I can't remember who else broke the line to, you know, go say hello to them, which was great. But yeah, they were ushering them pretty close, so we we're reasonably close um, to uh, Harrison and Phoebe. But they were obviously, as the um, as the um, the cast got um, more substantial, you know, they were later in the day, so. So the, uh, they were trying to push us. But they also had some fantastic, uh, at the end, um, they had the Hamilton uh, watch display where you could do a little thing. And they had the costumes, which was great, oh, just cool. to see Indies and Salah's costumes, you know, up close and personal as well. But that was the, that's, again, where um, a lot of, uh, you know, people in suits were, um, were just hanging around and us, which yes. is great. So, mm -hmm. um, so it worked out for us, which is really I love cool. that. I love that. So, so many things go through my mind, but let, let's talk about the movie itself. I know you've got a, a lot of great stuff on the indie cast. So I, I de certainly don't want to um, steal any of the, of the nuggets that you've, you've placed in there, but I do want to ask you, and I'm not sure. I did a review last week of the show. Cause I, mm -hmm. I've only seen it once at the time of this recording of coffee with Kenobi. And I loved it, but I also struggled with it. So you're going to be my Indiana Jones therapist. You know how much I love Crystal Skull. I think you and I are some of the biggest advocates for that film. Yes. I think I made the fatal mistake of going into it like I did with Phantom Menace uh, or even The Force Awakens to a degree. I, might, I tried to be mellow about it, but I couldn't. I mean, it's the last yeah. Indiana Jones movie with Harrison Ford and my, And I don't know if I had expectations. I was just so... I was so expecting like this swashbuckling adventure, carefree sort of a thing. But it really wasn't that. I feel like it was the first Indiana Jones movie that truly took the character a little more seriously, gave him a very um, human, uh, realistic persona of a man who's very much lost faith in himself in the world. He's lost his son. He's lost the love of his life. And uh, I feel like he spends the majority of the movie trying to sort of dig down deeply. And I feel like it really shows itself the most strongly when people get killed. Like the violence mm -hmm. in this, I think, is is very um uh it's not cartoony or comic book. You know, his no, the it's people pretty, in the university it's... die, his friend Antonio Band the Antonio Banderas character is murdered, and, and Indy has a, a, a massive version of that. So I think what I what I sort of philosophized was I think I I absolutely need to see it again, but I think it's hard for me to see my larger than life superhero man crush, Harrison Ford slash Indiana Jones, a uh, vulnerable. And, and it's almost mm. like it almost is like it affects you in, in in a way where you're like, gosh, your heroes are vulnerable. That makes them more relatable, you know, in the classic Greek myth, the, the yes. more human the, the hero, the more uh, we could relate to them. So uh, what what do you what is your response to that? Well, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think this is probably the most realistic portrayal of India yes. that we have seen, mm -hmm. um, you know, Raiders. To a certain degree as well, but then he sort of moved into, um, you know, Temple of Doom, Last Crusade. He was a little more of not not a superhero, but you know, it was, things were a little lighter. Even though Temple of Doom was pretty dark, yes. you know, I think I think there was that. Whereas, yeah, we how do we see him? I mean, let's. I won't. I won't talk about the first twenty five minutes yet. But you know, when we see Indy proper, nineteen sixty nine. He's he's drinking heavily, which is something you know that um, was a bit of a bit of a shock. He is a little defeated. He's um, you know uh, you see that um, you see you know obviously they don't ex explicitly say it right away, but you see that flag that you're knowing that um, Mutt has um, has been killed. Which I sort of I don't I don't know they needed to to do that. That's I didn't you know. Catch that. I, Interesting. So yeah, there's a there's the 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 uh, the triangular flag, you know, saying obviously that you you know you, Mutt has passed away, and and Mitch and I had been surmising that we bet Mutt has been killed in Vietnam months and months and months ago, if not a mm. year ago. I think we were, you know, um, one of the theories we threw up on the wall obviously stuck with that. So it was hard. I think, I think one yeah one thing is it is a it's a bit more of a real 
for all the fantastical things that happen in this film, it is quite mm. realistic. The, the deaths too, we were quite shocked by yes. by that. And it's not um just uh, it's not uh, soldiers being shot. It's just innocent people, civilians, being, you know, civilians being being shot. And I, it does show how ruthless, you know, obviously um, Vola's um, people are. Mm -hmm. But that was a little bit of a bit of a shock. Um, so that took a little bit out of it, you know, because we were, I wasn't expecting expecting that i probably should have i mean i've only seen logan once but i know what that was like as well that's and, a good point you know main gold's other work so it's probably you know what it, it shouldn't have been super obvious but um that's what i was thinking you know that um it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of a shock um but i'm glad that we got to see indy not like that for very very long we only saw moments of that and we saw this you know vulnerable sort of um it's it's hard to see your um your heroes in that sort of position i think and yes. it was a little bit um you know took took you aback a little bit I, I i thought but there were also moments of you know that old indie magic coming together which was great and i'm glad that they didn't end um with him in that there was you know hope and um you imagine there are more adventures to come not that we'll see them but there are more adventures to come with that um you know that hat grab and that hope at the end of the uh, end of the film interesting see i took that as very symbolically at the end where uh the fact that he kept that hat under his bed and the whip as Sella tells us but in the end he when he grabs the hat off the fire escape and puts it back on they make a big show on that when marion says are you back he's back he's back in his own skin i don't think yep. he necessarily needs to be an adventurer anymore in fact i don't know that as he says to us i don't know if his body could handle it but mm. the fact that he's got his swagger back and he had, you know, he's that hat is such a big part of that persona of who he is and how he views himself and you now he presents himself that I feel like all is right with the world. He can just die a happy man because he's got he's yep. got his real trophy, his wife. Absolutely. I think I think that's right. And, you know, maybe um, maybe some of you bumped into him seeing, uh, you know, as a in his uh, late 70s, because he is uh, playing 10 years younger uh, in, um, in uh -huh. the film, you know, in the cinema at Star Wars, going to the premiere of Star Wars in New York at one of the theatres, going, hmm, he looks a bit familiar, this Han Solo guy. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, so one, one last thing. Uh, you, you said you would talk about it later, but talk to me about the CGI at the beginning. I was a little bit tougher on it. I'm not usually that guy. The only thing that took me out of it was I feel like, Harrison Ford's eyes are so expressive. And there were times when I would see the eyes and remind me of the kids in, oh gosh, that Christmas movie. I can never remember. Uh, where you uh, bring, Polar Express? Polar Express. Yeah, there, there's a part of me that was like that. And I I wish, because selfishly, I mean, like somebody else, I want any to continue in some way. And I don't think any fictional character is, is identified with the actor who portrays him as much as Harrison Ford is with Indiana Jones, Spider-Man, mm -hmm. Batman, James Bond. Other actors can play them and play them beautifully. Yep. And I'm sure it could happen. And then he just, we just are not used to that in our, in our lifetimes. What if they would have put like a younger actor in for the opening sequence instead of doing all that CGI work? I, I don't know. Well, it doesn't really matter. I, I still, well, we, we know that Anthony and Gruber was the body double for that's right. That which had to make you, you happy. Know, so, so I think, I think for us, the con disconnect is that we know that it's as an older person, we know that's not, young harrison ford and so there's always going to be that little bit of a the voice yeah there's going to be that little bit of a disc disconnect whereas mm. my my um uh niece and nephew when they saw rogue one they didn't know peter cushing had passed away they right. didn't they thought he was that they thought that was uh, the actor they didn't have any idea that that was a cg you know created character over top of the uh, um the other actor so for me it was a little bit yeah, the eyes sometimes, and that's what Kelly said. She goes, oh, those eyes were just a little bit, because he did, he was, they were pretty aggressive in there. You know, this was not uh, a, you know, a 30-second young Jack Sparrow walking past where you're going, oh, that's pretty good, or, you know, um, Michael Douglas or whatever, yeah, and, you know. Yeah. I think I think it was pretty darn good, and once you, um, once you just lean into it, just that's yeah. a rollicking adventure. That first 25 minutes is fantastic it's you know indy at, at his finest i think and pretty bold and exciting that was what took over a hundred 
uh, ILM artist to uh, create that opening sequence. Oh my gosh, yes. Well, you know, he, Harrison Ford has got a unique, a unique face, and you know, I know a lot of artists have a lot of trouble capturing it, and I think they did a, a an amazing, an amazing job. It's a great sequence and uh, worthy of uh, any Indiana Jones adventure. And groundbreaking, absolutely. So now I'm going to ask you the toughest question. I've yep. been thinking about this for weeks, and I don't think I can actually properly answer it myself. So um, can you rank the films from uh, your favorite to to um, not quite as good, but still pretty great? I don't, I don't know All if right. I can do it right now. I can do it with Star Wars, which is way more to choose from. Yeah. Um, okay, still Raiders is still number one for Same. me okay so that's a, that's a that's, that's easy. A, a given i i i fluctuate you mm -hmm. know and um and you, you it used to be always um temple uh, last crusade second then temple of doom and then i i find it hard to like king the crystal skull and as as we've said you know we both love that film yes. for me it's got a lot of things tied to it that aren't the film, you know, the creation of the indie cast, meeting all these friends, you know, all this sort of stuff. So yes. every time I watch that, I think of all those things, you know, they're somewhere in the back of my mind. And um, the same with Dial of Destiny. I, I, every, I'm, I've seen it three times. Um, and every time I see it, I think back to the premiere, seeing it, seeing it in the movie, seeing it with Steven Spielberg and James Mangold and Harrison Ford and, you know, all those, even if he ducked out for a what, burrito or something during the movie, it doesn't matter. You know, all those things are, um, are tied to the film. So I, so I don't think I can rank it yet because I've only seen it three times. Whereas, you know, even Crystal Skull, I've seen maybe 50 or 60 times. Yeah. And certainly Raiders are lost. I've, I've lost count and Temple and Last Crusade. So it's, it's there so it's it's there somewhere i'm not I'm, it's only it's probably the five fourth of them. yeah it's only it's only fifth probably at the moment because um because i just haven't seen it enough and um you know i need to i need to see it a few more times and there's so much you know when you see a film for the first time it's like yeah there was so much i haven't even had a chance to properly listen to john williams score yet so mm -hmm. you know because we've only just got back a few days ago and i've got a lot of things going on so i'm going oh i need to listen listen to that or there's things i want to look at i was on that train at the start there's all that stuff i need to look at what's that what's that you know the spirit of destiny how cool is that you know that they use that oh what about this i've got all there's so much to take in so i'm still i'm still waiting so you know maybe in a couple of months and when it comes out on you know, 4K. Um, I'll definitely be, um, you know, buying that. Um, and maybe they'll do another box set. Who knows? Hopefully, sure. with some deleted scenes because there's so many deleted um, or scenes that were in the trailer that weren't in the actual um, actual movie. You know, there's listening to um, James Mangold. I'm sure um, he usually. I think he usually does commentaries, and we've never had a commentary on an Indiana Jones film because Spielberg doesn't do them. So. Um, you know that will be another insight to hear all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I all I'd say is to uh, to all your uh, listeners and viewers is just you know if you haven't seen it, go out and see it. Definitely, it's it's a great fun movie. I don't know why you know it's not it's not the it's not bomb. You know, uh, people you know the internet people love to be toxic. They love to grab something. Um, we call it in Australia tall poppy syndrome. You know, if something is successful. Let's cut it down to size because how dare it be successful? Or That's right. How dare you want something to be successful? Or how you know what I really hate is that people. Um, I don't mind if people don't like it. You know that's fine. That's you know we can't like everything, but they're so enthusiastic in their hate for something, mm -hmm. and um, how dare you like something like that? So you know, don't that's Romeo and Juliet, right? Parade, it has please. much to do with love and less to do with hate. They just love to hate. Yep. And that's why yeah. uh, shows like ours, uh, I think, have continued to flourish because we believe in you can find pearls in anything. And we're not in this business to to be negative. I mean, I, I think it, I think there's tact and being critical, but also realizing and putting things sort of in their own just perspective. And I think I should apologize too because I made you try to rank the movies. That was very unfair. No, 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 I don't no, think no. I can do it either. <laughs>
that's okay. That's I, I you know, we all do, you. and it and it does all change, you know, with um how you're feeling or what have you, or yes. things like that. Like last, uh, you know, Crystal Skull as well. Then that's the last indie film that I got to see with my both my um mum and dad. You know, you know, mm -hmm. they're they're sadly no longer with us, and that's something you know that was a big part of my life. So you know that factors in. And yes. is Dial of Destiny perfect? No, there's uh, there's a few things I would I would I would have loved to have. Um, Antonio Banderas was fantastic, you know, great, but I really would have loved to have seen George Harris play Cap, um, Captain Katanga instead in that role. Me too. Me too. Um, Mads Mikkelsen was wonderful. One thing Kelly said when she first came, how the hell did he survive um, that um, bash? And with seeing it in IMAX the second time in, in America, you could see he has this scar. Oh, But yes. I'm thinking he does have a scar. I'm going... Wouldn't it have been good? Obviously, you can't have him have with a bleeding eyeball because that's his James Bond character. But maybe if he had an, you know, just an eye patch. Something. Every villain is better with an eye patch. Absolutely. You know? Or I was saying, you know, that wonderful. Um, I don't think it was Jim Starenko who did that concept art, but um, uh, maybe have a robotic arm and like someone was going. Well, you know, they did that in. Um, I think was it Cable in. Um, I'm not a, I'm a DC oh, guy, not a oh, Marvel yes. guy, but yes, yeah. But he had a rope, you know, so maybe that's a little bit too much. But I felt like they could have Something maybe given him a little bit more him. because he really hit, you that know. That sound effect was Mason and I went, ooh. And, and I, I love that you said that because my views of some of these movies have changed too. And in fact, forever I was like, well, Temple Doom's way low on my list. It's too dark, blah, blah. But then I watched again with Mason. It was his first time watching. It was about three weeks mm -hmm. ago. And I loved it. And he loved it. Yep. And he said, Dad, I love Short Round so much. I feel like if he was real, he would be my best friend. And he meant it. Yeah. You know, for a 10 year old to say that, just how could that not raise the stock of all of it in your eyes? Of course. And it was just great fun seeing Harrison Me in such terrific shape. I think uh, Last Crusade is the most personal because of the uh, the vulnerability and the the constant uh, wonderful dialogue between himself and Sean Connery. And there's there's so much to love about all of these movies. And you know, in Dial of Destiny, the, the real heart, uh, and who doesn't want to look like Harrison Ford uh, at 80 years old? I'd like to look like that now. And he's, you oh know, like gosh, significantly yes. older than me. So it, it was just terrific, terrific fun. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> Uh, it's always terrific fun to chat with you, my friend. I, I was I was really hoping this would work out today. I'm, I'm glad you're able to uh, get out of your cocoon of, of, of adrenaline to join us. And it's, it's been terrific to chat with you. Please let us know what's going on with the IndieCast and with, with you and Mitch's YouTube channel. Well, we're, um, we're, we're still here with the IndieCast. I've got a... Uh... Uh, we've got our basically coming out um, our next episode. I'm not sure which order it'll be, but probably we've got our roundtable that of us recording at that In and Out Burger right after the premiere with myself, Mitch, um, Les, David, and Laird Malamud. It's a bit spoilery, but it, now it's it's sort of um, we started off non-spoilery, and then uh, we just went we opened the floodgates. So we've got that, and then right after that will be our roundtable with myself, Mitch. Indiana Mick and Jerry Ordway when we saw it on opening day at uh, so we might cover some the same information but from a different perspective so that's coming out and then our next episode after that will be just a one-off because I don't want to get it buried in there will be my interview with John Reese Davis um, and uh, then we keep going with that and then uh, Mitch and Ed's Excellent Adventure is our next where I think we're recording on this week so our next episode will be I think it's going to be on Return of the Jedi Mm. And uh, given it's a 40th anniversary, and that means we don't have to do a lot of research because that is ingrained in us. It's more the hardest thing with that show, with um, our show is coming up with uh, our opening little little gag. What are we going to do? <laughs> how how is Mitch going to die on screen, or is it going to be me this time? Or what are we going to do? So sure. um, we'll see what happens. the The hardest thing is actually trying to remember what my password is to my laptop because I haven't used it in so, such a long time. Hopefully, I can still remember all that sort of stuff. I, I'm optimistic you're able to get the dust off of it and use your Indiana Jones sleuthing to figure that out. Ed, again, thank you so much for coming back on Coffee with Kenobi. And congratulations again on an incredible and successful experience. 
I uh, thank you so much, and thank you for all your you know help behind the scenes and um, your advice and everything like that uh, with helping me get uh, to uh, to the opening as well. It's been um, so much appreciated as your friendship as well. So thank you. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. 